good afternoon and welcome to today's IAC webinar, Standardizing Gastric Emptying Protocols, Practical Tips and Handy Hints. My name is Kelly Baer and I'm the Creative Design Manager with Marketing Communications at IAC. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to review a few technical matters and let you know how you can participate in today's session. We would like today's webinar to be interactive, so we encourage you to submit questions. To do so, use the questions tab located on the left side of your screen. Please submit your questions anytime during the webinar, as we will be monitoring questions throughout the presentation, and we'll try to answer as many of them as possible during the Q&A period. Also on the left side of your screen is the Resources tab. Click on this tab for links to today's handout, a PDF copy of these PowerPoint slides. Select the file name to download the handout. Lastly, in the lower left of the player, please note the Request Support button. If you experience any technical problems during the course of this webinar, you may click this button. A technical expert will be there to assist you with any issues you may have. For those who like to take notes during the presentation, look to the right of the slides and click the Notes tab. There you will see a white text box where you can take notes on today's webinar. These notes will be emailed to you automatically at the end of the session. To be eligible for the SNMMI CE credit, you must be registered logged into this webinar, then complete the survey. The survey will open automatically at the conclusion of the live session and be available from the IAC Pro Libraries website for three business days. If you are viewing this webinar in a group, please be sure you are also individually registered and logged into this webinar on another computer or device so that we have record of your attendance today. Today's presentation is being recorded and will be posted at a later time for on-demand viewing. And now I would like to introduce our guest presenter, Dr. Lorraine Figg. Dr. Figg serves on the IAC Board of Directors and on the IAC Nuclear Pet Board of Directors as a representative of the American College of Nuclear Medicine. Dr. Figg has been involved with IAC since 2001 as both an application reviewer and site visitor. Currently, she is Professor of Radiology, Nuclear Medicine at the University of Michigan and serves as a staff physician at the VA Ann Arbor Healthcare System. In addition to administrative teaching and clinical duties, Dr. Fig is active in clinical research and has authored and co-authored many scientific papers and abstracts. And with that said, I will now turn this webinar over to today's speaker, Dr. Lorraine Fig. Doctor? Hello, everybody, and welcome, and thank you, Kelly, for that nice introduction. And I'd like to thank the ISC for inviting me to give this webinar, and I'm delighted to be with you today, and this is my disclosure about involvement with IAC. Now, it's appropriate that we're giving this talk right around lunchtime. If you're eating your lunch or you just completed your lunch, there's a lot currently going on inside your stomach, and stomach function is the topic that I am going to talk about today. So just to get us all onto the same page, a little background before we start. Um, the stomach is a muscular J-shaped bag, as you can see if you look on the left of the slide. It consists of several parts. There's the gastroesophageal sphincter at the top, and uh, lower down we go around the fundus. Yeah. That functions as a um, reservoir to initially receive the food. And then lower down is the antrum and the pyloric area where grinding of solid food takes place and where the control of solid food emptying occurs. And looking on the right, I think we are all familiar with the contraction waves, also called peristalsis, that pass through the stomach from the fundus at the top down towards the antrum, and they push the food into the duodenum. And we're particularly aware of these as hunger pangs when the stomach is empty. But the stomach is way more than just a bag that fills and empties. Um, I don't want you to look at any of the details of the slide, but I've put it up here just to demonstrate how complex the stomach function actually is in terms of its nervous system controls, the enzymes that are produced by the stomach, and the hormonal control of stomach function. So all of these affect um, gastric emptying. And because of this complexity, there are many, many factors that affect gastric emptying, and we're going to learn more about them as we move through the talk. 
Now, here's the overview of the talk that I'm going to give today. I'm going to talk about the rationale for following the recommendations in the consensus guideline, which I'll explain in due course, for performing solid phase gastric emptying studies. We'll talk about the important elements that are contained in the consensus guideline. And towards the end, we'll talk about creating and using a standardized protocol and some of the pitfalls that may be encountered in its use. So let's start now with a case study. And here's our patient, Mr. Rice, not his real name. And he's saying, I have had diabetes for a long time. I feel very full after only a small amount of food, often very bloated. Sometimes I feel like I'm going to throw up and I have periodic abdominal pain. Mr. Rice goes to see his doctor who refers him to nuclear medicine where a solid phase gastric emptying study is performed. And when the results come back, Mr. Rice is told by his doctor, the study is normal. So let's wait and see how things go before we do any treatment. And I just want to point you to the, um, the graph on the right-hand side. The pa- I'm going to show this type of graph several times. The patient data is always in green. The upper limit of normal is always in red, and the lower limit of normal is in blue. So um, that's our format. It's a little confusing, but remember that the patient data is always the green line on the graph. However, now Mr. Rice really doesn't do very well. And one week later or so, he's feeling really awful. And he says, I can't go on. My symptoms are getting worse. I really need to go and see a different doctor. So he goes to see his different doctor. um, And and Mr. Rice is pretty upset about all all this because the new doctor says he's going to send him for a repeat gastric emptying study. Uh, But he goes and has it. He has to have another copay, and he's going to lose wages on his time off, so he's not happy, but he has a study. And on this particular study, his uh, gastric emptying is abnormal, and if you follow the green line, he's above the upper limit of normal, so he has abnormal gastric emptying. So how can this happen? Why was there first a normal study? And then an abnormal study. Why don't these two studies agree? So we'll come back to the specific reasons later. But I'd like first to look at the broader picture about the measurement of gastric emptying. As I'm sure you know, gastric emptying scintigraphy is the reference, or also called gold standard test, to measure gastric motility. However, there are very many variables that can influence the test results. And some of these are patient preparation, like withholding the appropriate drugs, the meal composition and amount, the type of study acquisition, how that's done, how the processing is done, how we analyze the study, and how we choose the normal values. And it was recognized as far back as 2007, 2008, that there was very much a lack of standardization of the methodology and the way the study was done was kind of all over the place with many labs just choosing their own protocols and not standardizing methods. So uh, some of the researchers that were interested in this problem considered what the negative impacts were of this lack of standardization of the methods across the U.S. And, of course, these variability in results could result in misinterpretation of the studies from one lab to another. Um, Lack of standardization also limits the comparison between institutions. As we saw, patient goes to one lab told normal, another lab told abnormal, Um, If the methods aren't the same, you you can't compare over time between institutions or even on the same day. Um, It would lead, as in our patients, to unnecessary exam repeats and clearly decreases the confidence in the results obtained if 
one lab's calling a study normal and then another is saying it's abnormal. So these uh, researchers who were part of two societies, first of all, uh, Society of Nuclear Medicine, as they were then, now as in MMI, and also the American Neurogastroenterology and Motility Society, sent representatives to get together to try and make decisions on what a standard optimal gastric emptying study would be. And they came up with this publication in JNMT, published in 2008. And after that, the Society of Nuclear Medicine published the findings in a procedure guideline for adult solid meal gastric emptying study. And that was published in JNMT also in 2009. Now, I have those references for you at the end of the study, and they're also in the handout. So um, these results were published, um, and it's now about seven years since the publication of the procedure guideline. And here at the IAC, we were interested in the degree of compliance with the recommendations. And that interest came because we had noticed anecdotally that uh, when reviewing protocols, we noticed that some of them were not in compliance with the consensus recommendations that um, editorials and other articles had been written trying to uh, convince people, persuade people to follow the consensus. So um, what I see the research uh, division decided to do was measure the compliance with the standardized protocol in a total of 129 laboratories that were applying for accreditation in the years 2013-2015. And those labs were various institution types like private practice, hospital, clinics, etc. So in different practice settings across the U.S. And the results that came out of this were actually um, very interesting. And let me just explain how to look at this. The red bars mean not compliant with the consensus protocol, and the green bars are those in compliance with the consensus protocol. And we found that more than 50% of the protocols were not compliant for the various um, parameters that we looked at, such as, as you see along the bottom of this graph, what we looked at was meal, medications, blood glucose, dose, uh, positioning of the patient, image frequency and duration, and whether the reporting of the results were as percent retention. So we presented this um, in June at the annual meeting of the SNMMI um, as poor adherence to gastric scintigraphy guidelines. And um, a couple of other things just to note, when you look at meal, which is this one here, um, you'll notice that only 31% of meal protocols were fully compliant with the consensus protocol. And there was actually only a tiny percentage of labs that were fully compliant in all the variables of the protocol. So this uh, disturbed us, um, and we wondered why this was so and what could be done to promote compliance with the protocol variables, and that's one of the reasons why I'm here today. And the way that we're going to go through um, the protocol is to go through various sections of it. First, patient preparation, then the composition of the meal, acquisition, processing, interpretation, and reporting. It's pretty much in the order in which we would actually do a patient. So hopefully all of this will make good sense to you as you go along. And I'll try and explain in each case why it's so important that the, the protocol should be followed. So we're going to start then, as I showed you, with patient preparation. So the first item here is uh, withholding appropriate medications, and we'll go through what those medications are. Um, then to start with an empty stomach, overnight fasting is preferred, or at least four hours before the study begins, but it's very important to be NPO because if you person's recently eaten, 
and then you add the standard meal on top of their own meal, obviously that's going to affect gastric emptying. And the last one is measuring the blood glucose in diabetic patients. And again, I'm going to explain to you why that's needed and uh, talk about adjusting the insulin dose. So let's now look at withholding medications. Most of these drugs should be withheld for two days. And I think that most of you will be familiar with this group of drugs, the um, prokinetic agents, the ones that enhance gastric emptying. These are the drugs like metoclopramide or Reglan, Zelnorm, and also erythromycin, which is an antibiotic. And if you don't discontinue these drugs, they may lead to a normal gastric emptying result in a patient who actually has gastroparesis. However, there's a caveat because occasionally we are asked to study patients who are on their prokinetic agents to assess whether that drug is having a therapeutic effect, is the treatment working, and then it is appropriate to study the patient while he or she is taking those drugs. So that's a little bit of context that has to be looked at. And generally, the referring provider will say, please study on our drug to uh, determine therapeutic effect. So those drugs I think we are familiar with, but there are a lot of other drugs that affect gastric emptying but haven't been specifically prescribed for their effect on the gastrointestinal tract. And one of the most important uh, groups of drugs are these, the opiates. And um, in, in opiates, they um, slow gastric emptying. And also the next group down, the anticholinergic agents, these also slow gastric emptying. So if not dis- discontinued prior to the study, they could then result in a false diagnosis of delayed gastric emptying. You can imagine a normal patient taking a drug to slow gastric emptying will appear abnormal. So um, a lot of people are taking opiates when they come to have a gastric emptying study. We may not be aware. We have to specifically ask about um, these, this group of drugs. There's also a long list of other drugs, drugs that can affect gastric emptying, and I've listed the most important ones there. So my point is, here's a handy hint, all of these drugs are important, not just the prokinetic agents like Reglan. And ISC is currently compiling a list of drugs that affect gastric emptying, and we expect that we can make that list available to you in the near future. So let's uh, switch gears slightly and talk about measuring blood glucose, which is also one of the important factors in uh, preparing the patient appropriately. So why should we measure blood glucose? And, and uh, we found that many people, most labs do not measure blood glucose before they start. But it is very important to have a record of blood glucose before you start the study because hypoglycemia causes a delay in gastric emptying. And when should we measure? Well, that should be just before the gastric emptying study Ideally, when you are doing a gastric emptying study, the fasting blood glucose should be less than 200 milligrams per deciliter, but many labs accept a slightly higher value, and I've seen different recommendations um, up to about 250, 270 could be okay, but ideally less than 200 milligrams per deciliter is best. And when it comes time to give the report, The blood glucose value should be recorded in the report so that um, people who are interpreting and um, looking at the results can factor in whether the patient had a high blood glucose at the time. Um, We uh, also recommend that if the blood glucose is over 270, it can be lowered by means of insulin with physician supervision, of course, or the test can be rescheduled for another day when the blood glucose um, would be in the range that we would like it to be. So now I want to look at um, how the stomach empties. Um, we've, we've done patient preparation, and before we start talking about emptying, there are a few issues just to go through. 
Um, the first is that solid foods empty from the stomach in two distinct phases. The first stage is the lag phase where the um, food, or in this case it's going to be radio-labeled food, is going to um, enter into the fundus of the stomach, which is sort of like a reservoir. And then after the lag phase, the stomach starts to empty in a linear fashion. So there's two parts of the curve, and you can actually see them when you look at the images. Initially, Tracer only in the, in the fundus, and later it starts moving down towards the antrum, and then in the later image, it's mostly cleared from the stomach and in the bowel. So here at the bottom, I've uh, described the two phases of gastric emptying, of solid gastric emptying, with the lag period, which has a very variable amount of time, 5 to 25 minutes before it starts moving down towards the fundus. Now, another thing about gastric emptying is that it is extremely dependent on the meal content. And there are foods that, and foods and situations that slow gastric emptying. And what slows gastric emptying is, first of all, solid compared to liquid, and then fats slow gastric emptying compared with carbohydrates and protein. And I know, you know, we're all aware of that because you feel really full for a long time after you've had a fatty meal, and that's because the fatty meal is taking a lot longer to empty the stomach than if you just have something that's just plain sugary and that kind of goes through you and, you know, you're hungry like a half an hour later, but a fat meal can keep you full for a couple of hours. So obviously that makes a big difference. Then um, whether the foods are indigestible versus highly digestible makes a difference. So like indigestible foods, lots of vegetables stay in the stomach for longer. If the food is, uh, has high calories, it'll stay in the stomach longer. If the food is acid and if the volume is large and the particle size of the food is large, it stays in the, in the stomach for longer. So all of these things affect the gastric emptying and that's why we have to take them into account and that's why it's very, very important that the meal is standardized. And uh, this is a very important issue that when we, we did our study, we found that the meal was not very well standardized. This is a standardized meal. This is the exact standardized meal, and I'll point to this right away. Nothing more and nothing less. This is the meal. So what is it? First of all, it's uh, 0.5 to 1 millicuries of technetium sulfocolloid, which has been scrambled with 4 ounces of liquid egg whites, also known as egg beaters, or there are many generic versions of that. And when I say scrambled with, I mean cooked with. And I'll come back to that in a moment. Two slices of white toast, 30 grams of jam or jelly, 120 ml of water, and all of this should be ingested within 10 minutes. Now let's talk a little bit more about the meal preparation. The most important point here is that when... The eggs are being prepared. They must be cooked together with the sulfur colloid. There is a reason for this. The reason is that egg white protein is denatured when it's heated, and then it can form a stable bond with the sulfur colloid. So what it means is then that the sulfur colloid is actually incorporated into the solid. It's not alongside the solid. It's actually a solid because it's incorporated into the solid. So if the tracer separates from the egg, if it's not cooked with the egg, the test results will not be the same as for a solid meal. So if you look at solid meal emptying, which is that curve, it's slower than semi-solid and slower than liquid. Liquid is fast, fastest. And the semi-solid, which would be if you just took already cooked scrambled eggs and mix, mixed them with sulfur colloid and didn't get that incorporation, you wouldn't get the same rate of emptying as for a solid meal. 
And that is a very key point. And that's more than a handy hint. I would say that is just like a vital um, aspect to consider about the meal preparation. So uh, another thing that we found when looking at protocols is that many labs were using whole eggs and not the egg beaters. So why is that important? Well, it's very important because when you um, use whole eggs and inject the, the uh, sulfur colloid directly into the yolk, you do not get good binding of the yolk um, to the sulfur colloid. Um, the yolk is mostly fat and actually does not bind very well to sulfur colloid. So when we look at the different um, labeling efficiencies, when you use um, the egg white, it's about 85% binding, but it's way lower, uh, more like uh, 40% when um, egg yolk is used. So egg yolk the method of using whole eggs and injecting the sulfur colloid into the egg yolk is not a good method and won't re uh, result in re reliable solid binding. And there's another factor with not using um, whole eggs, and that is that the fat in the yolk is going to affect gastric emptying. I'm sure you remember a couple of slides back, we said how important fat was for delaying gastric emptying. So if you're using whole eggs, you're adding a lot more fat to the meal and the stomach is going to empty at a different rate than when you use um, uh, egg beaters alone. Now, I think you could probably answer this question yourself. How about adding tracer to pre-scrambled eggs? Well, um, that's a no-no, of course, because you're not going to incorporate the tracer into pre-scrambled eggs. It's going to sit as a, sol as a two components, a solid and a liquid, and they cannot incorporate. I mentioned um, a couple of slides back, and I just wanted to return to that, about eating the meal within 10 minutes. Um, it's hard for some of these patients to eat fast because they get nauseated easily, but it is important to try and encourage them to eat relatively quickly and ideally within 10 minutes because you want to create a kind of a bolus in the stomach. You don't want the stomach to already be emptying while the patient is still slowly, slowly eating the meal. So. I would never tell anybody to really gobble the food down, but it is important to try and encourage them to eat that meal within the um, protocol recommendation of 10 minutes. And just to uh, bring home to you some of the, the issues when we looked at meal um, guidelines compared to the IAC labs that were applying for accreditation, we found up in that first row that only 31% um, had the exact consensus meal with the liquid egg white. And a majority of labs that used the wrong protocol used whole eggs. So I would caution you against using whole eggs, and I think you can understand why I'm saying that. Um, we also, when we looked at these protocols, we found a, a, a wide variety of alternative meals um, there were, uh, as you can see on the left, the peanut butter sandwich, the honey bun, the cornflakes. Clearly, again, from what I've said, you'll know that adding sulfur colloid to those meals is not going to give you a bond between the food and the tracer, so it won't be a true solid meal. And then, of course, peanut butter, you know, almost pure fat is going to change gastric em emptying um, ex you know, extensively. Um, I also said a couple slides back, nothing more, nothing less. We did find that some labs added additional items to the egg meals, so they changed the meals by using fruit juice or milk instead of water, adding butter instead of jam to the toast, and adding items like lettuce and tomato and peaches. All of these will add fiber, add calories, add fat, you know, depending on what they are, and will change the gastric emptying. So 
That's why I'm emphasizing nothing more and nothing less than the exact meal. Um, now let's just talk about oatmeal for a moment. Oatmeal has a place. Um, oatmeal definitely has a role when the patient's allergic to eggs or has an intense dislike of eggs, but know that the reference um, value data, this, in other words, the standard normal values are very limited for oatmeal. And I would summarize by saying that the oatmeal gastric emptying study can be used in rare cases, but shouldn't be used as the routine protocol because of um, the fact that the uh, chase is not incorporated into the oatmeal and that the normal values of the standard meal don't apply to oatmeal. So that's what I would wanted to tell you about the meal. And now I want to switch gears and go on to image acquisition. And these are the recommendations for from the protocol, the consensus protocol, that a... Um, well, I'll let you read them. There's no point in me actually reading every word. You can see the collimator, the matrix, the peak, and then anterior and posterior planar images are recommended with a geometric mean calculation. If somebody's doing the study and doesn't have a dual-head camera, they, they can alternate. It's very cumbersome, but you can alternate flip between anterior and posterior at each time point or use an LAO image, um, and I'll explain a little bit more on that in the next slide. And then the image acquisition on the standard protocol is at the four, the immediate, and then four time points that are listed. So I've stressed a little bit on this anterior and posterior image, and why have I said that? The reason is, if you look at this picture here, you can see that the fundus of the stomach appears more posteriorly located than the antrum so that the tracer actually moves from posterior to anterior. But not everybody's stomach is the same. So some people, you know, they have more of an anterior-posterior shift than others. So um, imaging only in the anterior view will not be as accurate. There'll be a um, kind of fudge factor of the, of the counts moving closer towards the camera, which will give you a, a false result compared to the standard uh, protocol. That's why we need to acquire both posterior and anterior images and then um, do the geometric mean correction. Um, as you can see, the formula there in green and as I said, you can do a single LAO, but it's less accurate. So now, let's look at image processing. So when we're processing the study, uh, we have to take some care with it. Um, you have to draw the region of interest around the entire stomach in the anterior and posterior views, and be careful to include the fundus and the antrum and avoid um, any adjacent small bowel um, that might be right up against your region of interest or even actually overlapping the stomach and then that's going to be a little difficult to avoid altogether. And this is an example, I think, of good region of interest uh, placement in anterior and posterior views. Um, you can see that we don't have every time point, but we have immediate one hour, two hour, and four hour um, and um, as you can see, the initially the trace is mostly only in the fundus, then it moves down to the antrum and then empties. This slide is just a reminder of trying to avoid overlapping small bowel activity as best as one can, although sometimes it's just not possible to exclude it entirely. Um, <clears throat> and you, you should probably note that for the interpreting physician. So here's an example of suboptimal processing that does not include the entire stomach region. So what you're looking at is anterior and posterior images at different time points, moving from the initial upper left to the three-hour time point um, at the lower right. And as you can see, the 
person who um, did the region did not include the whole stomach. They're really only looking at uh, the funnel emptying, not the entire stomach emptying. So um, that is just a caution and, and, and a pointer. Remember, we, we showed pictures of the stomach. They, it looks J-shaped. So always look for that J-shape. And maybe what sometimes you have to do is look at the final image or the intermediate images to look at the shape of the stomach. It's sometimes not always evident what the shape of the stomach is in the initial picture when you're seeing the fundus only and you don't really have much activity in the antrum yet. Now, once the, um, the region of interest has been um, prepared and the geometric mean is done, you'll also correct all the data for technetium decay and then express gastric emptying as not so much emptying but as percent retention. This is the standard to, uh, to express as percent retention. And the upper limits have been established in the right column, upper normal limit for gastric retention. And it's really easy to remember. At, obviously, at time zero when you start, it's 100%. But then at 1, 2, 3, 4, it's 90, 60, 30, 10. And anything higher than that is um, in the abnormal range. Now, many labs also will express it not just as a, um, in a, a uh, table, as I just showed you, but they'll also, or in place of that, show it as a graph. And um, this is a normal study, um, as I explained before, patient data is in green, and you can see it's within the upper and limit of upper and lower limits of normal throughout the study. Now, some people ask, why do we need to image for so long? Um, that's a long study to do a four-hour protocol. I think that some of you probably remember much shorter protocols in the past when we used to calculate T1 half. That study was a lot shorter. But the advantage of doing the four-hour protocol is that we can detect a lot more abnormal studies by imaging for a longer time. In fact, a retention of more than 10% of the meal at four hours is considered the best discriminator between normal and abnormal. And 29% more abnormal studies are found um, when a four-hour um, imaging duration is done, and that was published uh, uh, in 2007. So there's a disadvantage about this, of course. There's the inconvenience to the patients who have to stay in nuclear medicine for a long, long time, and then there's a scheduling difficulty as well. Um, so in more uh, recent years, there have been various protocols proposed uh, on how to shorten the study, omitting the three-hour, etc. cetera. There's, there's different um, proposals out there, but at this time there's actually no consensus. So for now I would say it's probably good to definitely get that four-hour image because that is the way of picking up the most, uh, the greatest number of abnormal studies. So here we get back to our patient, Mr. Rice. Mr. Rice, here are the two graphs. Remember the one normal and the one, this is the normal and then the abnormal. And clearly the answer of why he first had a normal and then an abnormal study is how long the study was carried out. In the left-hand side, when it was considered normal, it only went to two hours. In study two, the repeat, when he was called abnormal, it, he went out to four hours. And at the four-hour image, it picked up that he had more than 10% of the tracer remaining in the stomach, and the stomach was abnormal. Now, I could have used many other examples. I could have said the meal was different. You know, there were differences in the region of interest. There were differences in the patient preparation. There's so many things that could have gone wrong to make one study normal and the rest and the second one abnormal. This is just one example of what can go wrong. 
there are many in gastric emptying. Now, um, I thought I'd just show you very quickly a few clinical um, examples. And this one is a normal study, and I'm not going to go through that again. We've already seen that. This one is abnormal. You can see that the tracer first starts out in the fundus, but really doesn't migrate down to the antrum. And that's um, often seen in uh, diabetic gastroparesis, where you get this delay in um, transit of the tracer down um, into the antrum. And so just to uh, give you a little bit of background on that, uh, what is diabetic gastroparesis? Um, after uh, 10 or 20 years of diabetes, but sometimes much shorter, uh, about 30 to 60% of diabetics can develop a um, visceral, in other words, organ, autonomic neuropathy, nerve problem involving the vagus nerve that supplies the stomach. And they can also get some impaired smooth muscle contractility. So problems with the smooth muscle and malfunction of the vagus nerve lead to slowing of the gastric emptying. And that can occur in type 1 and type 2, type 2 diabetes. But paradoxically, some diabetics have more rapid than normal gastric emptying. But that's the minority. Okay, in this slide, I just wanted to show you an example of a little bit of um, gastroesophageal reflux. In the first study, you can see that the esophagus hasn't cleared, so that's the immediate. At 60 minutes here, there's no activity in the esophagus, but then coming back to uh, two hours when the patient came back, again, there's a little bit of activity in the lower end of the esophagus, so that's what mild gastroesophageal reflux looks like, and I did have to window that up a lot for you to be able to see it, but that's an example of it. Here's an example of um, hiatal hernia with the stomach sitting in, a lot of the stomach sitting inside the chest. Now, somebody tried to look at gastric emptying here by drawing the regions, but this one will be very hard to do accurately if, if their stomach actually um, herniated up into the chest. I guess the only way would be to do regions involving the entire stomach, including the chest. Uh, but uh, it would be, who knows whether this would conform with the normal values. And another couple of uh, studies. The top example is achalasia. That's a motility disorder of the esophagus. And in that case, um, the lower esophageal sphincter fails to relax, and there's a lack of peristalsis in the esophagus. And in, in that um, case, at the top, it's clear that you really could not calculate an accurate gastric emptying study because the tracer never completely clears from the esophagus at all and is always entering the, the stomach right through the entire study. The bottom example is a dumping syndrome. I'm sure you know about that. That's when the stomach empties too rapidly and the food enters the small intestine largely undigested and then that causes the pancreas to release excess insulin into the bloodstream and the patient gets symptoms of low blood sugar. So, um, you know, dumping syndrome often occurs after a person's had gastric surgery uh, but it can also occur in diabetes. And um, here's our final example. Um, this example shows that um, it's only 90 minutes of the stomach, oh, sorry, of the study, but there's no emptying from the stomach at all during the first 90 minutes. And the reason for this is the patient has a cancer of the stomach at the pylorus with great narrowing of the pylorus and pretty much no um, activity is getting through or minimal into the gut. And this is a pitfall in the, on the interpretation side because we really can't distinguish anatomic obstruction from a functional gastroparesis. They kind of can look the same on nuclear medicine because we don't have the anatomic detail that we might get from a barium study. Okay, uh, let's go on to reporting. 
and uh, the information that should be documented in a patient report. So uh, that would be medications that may alter gastric emptying, the symptoms that occurred during the study, whether there was any deviation from the standard meal composition, whether the patient took a long time to ingest the food or vomit the food. So um, in in that case, uh, there could be problems with the um, interpretation of the study and using the normal values. Then we need to put in the percent tracer retention at the specific time points, the visual assessment, did we see esophageal reflux or um, tracer remaining in the esophagus, and a comparison with prior studies. So to summarize now, um, I've told you the uh, protocol for solid radionuclide gastric emptying. And these are the key points I feel that are most important for you to follow um, in the uh, to to, uh, confirm conform with the consensus protocol. And I'll just let you read them, and they are in the handout, so I'm not going to actually read them, but they're in the categories of patient preparation, the particulars of the meal, the acquisition parameters, and the processing and interpretation. And as we've implied, reference values won't always apply and they're not valid when you don't follow the consensus protocol. The patient had gastric surgery because the emptying of the stomach will be different if it's smaller or has a sleeve in it or has had some kind of, you know, bariatric um, surgery manipulation. If the patient only ate part of the meal or vomited, if tracer remains in the esophagus or there's substantial reflux, if the solid wasn't properly prepared or labeled, if the patient's very emotional or anxious, um, the stomach will empty more slowly, so it is important for us to reassure the patients about the study. If the patient didn't follow preparation instructions, if the patient ate very slowly, if the technical problems like decay correction wasn't performed or the geometric mean, or there were technical problems with the region or small bowel overlap. So this is a lot of things that can interfere with um, interpreting the study correctly, and that's why I'm stressing them to you now. So adherence to consensus guidelines. Why is it that people are not following the, um, the, the guidelines fully? Um, there, there can be many factors, and, and I um, am sympathetic about all of them. For example, you know, a lot of people are not uh, unaware of the guidelines. There's just so much literature these days. We have an information overload. Um, It's really hard to keep up with everything going on. Um, We're in an era where we're asked to do more with less. There's not enough staff. There's not enough time. There's not enough resources for making changes. People don't like change also. You know, people get stuck in habits. They are resistant to change. They, you know, prefer to stay in their comfort zone. The um, longer protocol is a little tricky also. Uh, It might affect scheduling efficiency. Some people would say it's not cost effective. And uh, there are some uncertainties in the literature at the moment. So these are things to think about. And I think just... Thinking about them and knowing about them are helpful to try and identify where barriers might exist. Um, These are my references, and so you'll have those in the download. And um, I'd like to thank uh, Maria Costello, who's the Director of Accreditation in the Nuclear Pet Division, who invited me to give this talk, and Mary Beth Farrell, who suggested exploring the subject from a research perspective, Dr. Leonie Gordon, a colleague, and Dr. Harvey Ziesman, who has written extensively on gastric emptying studies and gave me permission to adapt a couple of his slides. And I would like to thank you, the audience, for your kind attention, and I hope you have found this useful. Thank you. Okay, great. At this time, we'll begin the Q&A session. From IAC, I'd like to introduce Maria Costello, Director of Accreditation for Nuclear Pet, who will assist Dr. Fig with questions today. Maria, would you like to start us off? Sure. So we got um, a lot of great questions, and I'm not sure we'll get to all of them, but um, we, if we don't get to them, we will 
answer them later. Um, so, Dr. Fig, what kind of activities should a patient perform between imaging sessions? I think this means, is it okay for the patient to get up and walk around? Should they stay still? Or what does it really matter? Um, it isn't mentioned in the protocol, but I do think that it, it, it matters. Well, for, for certain, you don't want patients to do anything that will affect their gastric emptying. So things that could affect their gastric emptying would be if they went and had a cigarette, if they went and ate something else, uh, if they started to get restless and wanted to exercise by, you know, jogging up and down the stairs, all of those things affect gastric emptying and we don't want them to get anxious. So I would say the best thing would be to be in a quiet and calm environment and, um, you know, just quietly wait between the study, between the imaging sessions, which is probably what most patients do and that would make it more reproducible. The next question, um, dual isotope gastric emptying studies with indium as the liquid phase and tech as the solid seem to have fallen out of favor. Does this test still have utility, and if so, when is it indicated? Well, that's a very interesting question because um, the, the uh, person who asked the question is right. It has fallen out of favor, but believe it or not, because the pendulum always swings back and forth, it's coming back into favor, and um, at the VA, we don't use it, but at the university, they have now started the protocol of doing um, all uh, dual isotope studies of the combined liquid and solid. So there have been some recent papers um, that are pushing for dual isotope studies because um, it's being recognized more and more that liquid gastric emptying is also a very important parameter to look at. We used to always say um, solid studies are the way to go. They are the most sensitive. But it's now being determined that liquid studies actually have a very important part to play as well. And some diabetics have normal um, solid and abnormal liquid studies. So I would say we don't know exactly where we are right now, time will tell. I think more papers will probably address this, but um, my prediction is that dual isotope is coming back. Um, does it matter if the patient is supine or upright? Um, that is another interesting question. Um, clearly, people are meant to eat sitting up. It's very rare that people actually eat lying down unless they are sick and um, as the optimal positioning for a, a gastric emptying study is sitting up and not lying down. Okay. Um, yeah. And, and um, to go along with that one, if I have a single head gamma camera, which is the best way to perform the gastric emptying study, LAO or anterior and posterior views? So um, I would say that's, uh, you know, a practical issue and a time issue for the person who answered the question. The best way, the most accurate way, is clearly getting an anterior image and then flipping the camera and getting a posterior image immediately. That will give you the most accurate results, but it's, a, you know, a little more cumbersome than doing the LAO. But if they asked which is the best method, um, I would say getting two images, anterior and posterior, is more accurate than the LAO, although the LAO is a little more convenient and takes less time. Okay. Um, we have patients bring their insulin to take after they eat. Should this be held? Um, uh, it, what they should do is uh, measure blood glucose. If this is something that they're normally doing and they are using the doses that are, you know, the conventional doses, um, I think it is fine to give insulin and many labs actually do um, encourage patients to bring their insulin and give insulin. The, the main thing to avoid is going to be the hyperglycemia. So, yes, now they'll have to adjust the insulin, of course, because the meal may be much less or more than their normal breakfast. 
So, you know, they, they've got to do a little bit of a fudge factor. But, yes, it's fine to give insulin before the study. And then how important is the 120 ml of water? I have seen staff give an entire 8-ounce bottle of water. I can't get compliance, so please address for me. I think the 120 ml is also vital. Yes, yeah, so um, everything is important in that protocol. As I said, nothing more, nothing less. We saw a graph about, or a slide that said, said the volume of the meal is important, so uh, liquid adds to the volume inside the stomach. So I would say, yes, it's very important and, and probably not very difficult to get exactly 120 ml of water, you know, so... Why give them more and risk that the stomach would empty a little slower than um, if it was just the right amount of water? I would say, you know, when in doubt, follow the consensus. Um, and where do you draw the line between accepting a partially eaten meal versus giving the patient longer than 10 minutes versus abandoning the study? Well, uh, that's a sort of unanswerable question. It's kind of a judgment call for the physician who's supervising the study. I mean, you know, at the extreme, you now you know that the lag phase could take uh, 5 to 25 minutes. I mean, if they really were still eating and hadn't got the, the food down at 20 minutes, I think I would personally abandon the study at that point. If it was a little longer than the 10 minutes, uh, you know, I, I think that would be okay. I would go ahead if it was still, you know, 12, 15 minutes, I'd probably say okay. But then I would like to know that when I interpret the study to, you know, put that into the report as a caveat to say, well, these results may not be quite as accurate as our usual gastric emptying studies because the patient ate the meal much slower than expected. Um, Did I answer all parts of that? I'm not... I, I believe so. Okay. Um, should the study be terminated if retention is less than 10% before four hours? Uh, that has been a, uh, a newer... Uh, recommendation. That's another one of those new pieces of information that has come out in the literature but isn't fully accepted. Some people have said this is a very good compromise because then we can, um, you know, stop the study prematurely. So many people would say, yes, uh, I read that article and uh, that is uh, the way to go, but it's not yet in the consensus. I mean, as all things in protocols, these get revised from time to time, and I predict that in the future, somebody's going to take a look at the new information in the literature and change the consensus. But at the moment, they haven't. This, again, would be like the, you know, the individual physician preference because they have something in the literature to back up that uh, greater than 10%. Um, uh, or less. It's actually um, not quite what, you, what you're saying. It's different at different time points, but it is in um, a paper that Dr. Ziesman will, um, has written. Okay, and I think we probably have time for one more question. Okay. Um, how do you use oatmeal as an alternative? Do you eat it with toast and water by itself, or how is it? How is that meal used? Right. So um, there's no toast with it. The oatmeal is the meal. And um, I'm just going to go back to that slide uh, because the exact protocol of it is actually um, in the article. In that uh, reference, um, it explains how to do it. And um, the problem with the protocol, if you just look at what I wrote there, there's two ways of making it. They make it either with sugar or sweetener. Obviously, that makes a slight difference because of more calories with sugar. So um, it's not exactly a perfect protocol because it's not entirely standardized. But I believe that it's just the oatmeal. Uh, but I don't want to misspeak, so I'm going to direct you to the uh, protocol to look up the exact detail. We don't actually use it here. Okay, and I think that's all we have time for, but we do have everyone's email address, so um, 
and we will have a list of the questions, so we'll be able to get an answer to you. Ellie um, will take over from here because I believe we are all done now. Okay, great. Thanks again, everyone, and a very special thank you to Dr. Lorraine Fig for today's presentation. Again, we invite you to contact IAC with any questions that were not answered during the Q&A session. To receive continuing education credit for attending this webinar, please complete the survey. The survey will appear on your screen automatically at the conclusion of this live session and also be available from the IAC Pro Libraries website for three business days. In the upper left, you'll click on My Webinars, look for the title of this session, Standardizing Gastric Emptying Protocols, Practical Tips, and Handy Hints. Beneath this title, you will see the link Take Evaluation. Click this link to complete the survey. Your certificate can then be accessed and printed from the very next screen and any time thereafter through a new link on the My Webinars page called View Certificate. If you have any questions about the survey, please contact us at webinars at intersocietal.org. Once again, we thank you for joining us today and appreciate your participation.